Greetings to everyone with us. On behalf of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, I would like to welcome you to the first lecture of the GP2 lectures this academic year. This series is organized by the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, which is part of our Faculty of Philosophy here at the Angelicum Rome. This lecture, as well as the entire GP2 lecture series, could not have taken place without the support of our university authorities. Father Thomas Joseph White, Director of Angelicum, and Father Serge Thomas Bonino, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, whom I would like to thank. Special thanks are also in order for the founders of St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, donors and supporters of the Institute, our audience and our viewers in front of the screens. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look and the challenges facing the modern world and the church in light of the life and thought of St. John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II has been embodied in the GP2 lecture series, which are monthly lectures of eminent interdisciplinary academics who will revisit the extraordinary contribution of John Paul II for our own day. I'm honored to invite you to listen to their first lecture, which inaugurates the third annual GP2 lecture series. In our series planned for this entire academic year 2022-2023, we will host such renewed lectures as Vittorio Senti, Miroslava Grabska, Antoine Ariakowski, Sister Helen Alford, Father Raymond de Souza, Dariusz Karłowicz, Russell Wino, Father Thierry Dominique Ambrecht and, fa and Father Franciszek Longchamp de Brier. Now, I'm pleased to give the floor to Dr. Dariusz Karłowicz, the initiator of the GP2 lecture series, philosopher, president of St. Nicholas Foundation, strategic partner of the Institute, and the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture program director. Dariusz Karłowicz will share more about our today's special guest. Good afternoon. Uh, dear friends, it's my honor to introduce to you um, Professor Joseph Weiler, University Professor at uh, New York University School of Law and Senior Fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard. Uh, he served previously as President of the European University Institute in, in Florence, uh, in Fiesole, I think, in fact. Precisely. <laughs> Professor Weiler is co-editor-in-chief of the European Journal of International Law and the International Journal of uh, Constitutional Law. He's the recipient of a doctorate honoris causa from the Catholic University of America. One of his notable books is uh, Un Europa Cristiana, Un Saggio Esplorativo, which has been translated into eight languages. I have a Polish copy on the desk, also in Polish between those eight languages. Uh, it is worth mentioning that in 2022, Joseph Weiler was honored with the Ratzinger Prize. Congratulations, Professor. Uh, in his lecture titled A Non-Christian Europe, is it possible? Professor Weiler will pose the question of how Christians who are becoming a minority in European societies can fulfill their vocation in the reality of secularization, which at times takes extreme Christophobic forms. As Professor Weiler will point out, the radical turn, the turning of the backs of European community on the ethical heritage of Christian civilization is a pressing challenge that demands a response from those for whom the Christian faith is the center of personal life. Professor Weiler, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> for your kind words, and it's uh, 
a special honor and a pleasure. And it's the first time that I'm in the Angelicum. So I really appreciate your invitation. Przeszełam specjalne pozdrowienia dla naszych kolegów w Polsce, szczególnie grupę czytania Biblii. Uh, you might know the Yiddish word chutzpah. I will give you the definition of chutzpah. Somebody, God forbid, who kills his father and his mother, and then he goes before the judge and says, mercy, I'm an orphan. That's chutzpah. And it's a little bit chutzpah on my part, a non-Christian, to come and talk about Christianity. So already in advance, I have to apologize for any misunderstanding, misrepresentation in what I have to say about Christianity and Europe today. And if I make mistakes, you will correct me. Grazie. So, the first question is, what do we mean when we say a Christian Europe? In some ways, the answer is so obvious. We just have to look around us at the architecture, at the art, at the music, at the literature, at the poetry, also at the political culture. And how can one deny the huge, not only historical impact, but present influence that the Christian tradition has had on what it means to be European? Now, attention, uvaga. We should not fall into hubris. European culture and European civilization, if I mention two or three books today, but one is a fundamental book by Remy Bragg, Le Voir aux Men. It's been translated into many languages. I don't know the, the English translation. Also in Polish. He explains Europe as a synthesis between Athens and Jerusalem, which becomes Le Voir aux Men. So it's, Europe is not only Christianity, but it also has roots in Athens, in the Enlightenment, etc. But it's the particular synthesis. To say that still does not mean that one can eliminate the fundamental impact of Christianity, not just on our history, but on speaking as a European, who we are. And also we have to remember that there are also dark chapters in this history. And the dark chapters are also part of our history. For good or for worse, mostly, we learn from them. So if it's so obvious, it's kind of strange. It requires an explanation why 20 years ago, when Europe tried to adopt a constitution, now I, when I say Europe, I mean the European Union, there was a huge debate about the inclusion of a reference to Christianity, to imitatio Dei, in the preamble to that constitution. The first line made reference to Pericles, Athens. And of course, there was a mention of the enlightenment tradition of rationality. But the proposal to include side by side a reference to the Christian Europe 
was rejected. Now, of course, whether it went in or didn't go out, or didn't go in, <coughs> would not make a difference to Europe. Because as I said, the Christian roots, the Christian impact are so evident. Uh, but the interesting question is, so if it's so evident, why not include it? Why was there a fierce debate and eventually it was rejected? Eventually also the whole constitution was rejected, but not for that reason. And it's Speaking as a constitutionalist, it was particularly strange for me because if we look at the population of Europe, and now in a narrow sense, the 27 member states of the European Union, half the population of Europe live in states where the constitution specifically makes a reference either to God or explicitly to the Christian tradition. So if you are making a constitution for Europe, how could you exclude the tradition which is reflected in the constitutions that govern half the population of Europe? So what is interesting is not to get angry, this is a scandal, etc. Who cares? Christianity has been around for 2,000 years and will be around in another 2,000 years. But it's still a sociological and political fact. What explains that omission? And I want to give, to speculate about three possible reasons. The first one is the tradition of the French Revolution, of laïcité. And particularly that part of that tradition which says, of course, we protect and defend freedom of religion, but religion is a private affair. It's something for the home when you go to church, but it has no space in public venues. That's the French tradition of laïcité. Public authorities cannot be seen in any way to be endorsing a, religion, a religious worldview. So therefore, if the Constitution contains a reference to Christianity, or to God, <coughs> it will violate that public-private notion of laïcité. Can I tell you a funny story? Uh, when the debate was ongoing, uh, Mr. Giscard d'Estaing, who was the president of the Constitutional Convention, invited me to a meeting. I, I really respect him. He was a true statesman. And in that meeting in The Hague, there were four or five prime ministers or former prime ministers and half a dozen foreign ministers and etc. And Giscard turns to me and he says, Professor, personally, I was in favor of a reference to Christian roots. But you know <coughs> that we operated under the principle of consensus. And there was not a consensus to include it. So we couldn't include it because we were working by consensus. And I looked at him and I said, President, you drafted the preamble. You could have put in a reference to a Christian roots and there would not have been consensus to take it out. So it would be there. So he looks at me and says, Monsieur le professeur, vous êtes méchante. C'est cattivo. <laughs> so that's one explanation. This French laïc notion that religion is acceptable, but it's part of the private sphere and cannot be part of the collective or state 
or public authority endorsement. The second reason I'm afraid to say is ignorance. Uh, secularization already begins in the 18th century, 19th century, uh, Nietzsche, God is, etc. But popular secularization really begins after the Second World War when the churches begin to become more and more empty. By some counts in France today, maybe 7% of the population go regularly to mass. La fide l'église. And therefore, it wasn't a cause that animated a large segment of the population out of ignorance. They had just, it wasn't something that was present in their self-understanding. You would ask young people, define yourself, and many of them, even if they were born Christian, even if they were baptized, even if their parents married in church, they wouldn't say, I'm a Christian. They would say many things about themselves. I'm a socialist, I'm French, I'm a vegetarian, whatever but not I'm a Christian. And therefore, this debate didn't resonate with large segments of the population. And the third reason is simply hostility. What in my book I called Christophobia. In other words, not you are religious, I am secular, or I am agnostic, and chacun a son goût. But my secularism means that I'm anti-religious. I'm hostile to religion. In some way, it was a sign, which is part of our reality today, of a new type of confessional state, where the confession is secularism. So, we have to be hostile to those kinds of manifestation. I'm speculating, but it's a worthwhile speculation not to get angry about the exclusion in the draft constitution of a reference to Christian roots, but to try and understand why something that is so obvious created such resistance. End of chapter one but we will come back to it. So let's try another definition, and this is the definition that I prefer. What does it mean to say a Christian Europe? For me, the only meaningful definition of a Christian Europe is a Europe in which a critical mass of the population maybe not necessarily a majority, but a real critical mass of the population, or practicing Christians. And by that I mean people who accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. And if we adopt that criterion, it's hard to speak of Europe any longer as a Christian Europe, because we don't have a mass of our population, which correspond to that definition. It's not, I was born a Christian, my parents are Christian. But I'm a Christian in the way I self-understand myself with those obligations. And I want to add something to which I will return. <clears throat> it's not enough, I think. You see, this is where I, the chutzpah comes in. It's not enough to say, if I say to somebody, what does it mean for you to say I am Christian? And he or she answers, it means that I lead an ethical life. Now, make no mistake, leading an ethical life is central to the Christian message. It's a necessary condition. But it doesn't exhaust it. And we should remember 
and the we, here I mean we religious people, that we don't have a monopoly over ethics. Ethics is universal. Ethics is written on the heart of human being. When Cain kills Abel, and the Lord says to him, where is your brother? He doesn't say, I killed him, you never said we're not allowed to kill. Because as a human being, he understands you're not allowed to kill. So ethics is a central obligation of the practicing Christian. But it doesn't exhaust it. There's much more to it. And to that I will also return later. And what is more to it is to accept a whole range of transcendental truths. In this respect, it's anti-Kantian. It's heteronymous, not autonomous, of transcendental truths and mystery that are part of reality. For example. So from that perspective, it's hard to speak today about the Christian Europe. Poland might be, still might be an exception in terms of a critical mass of people. But it really is an exception. If we look even at this wonderful country in which we are now, it's still, you know, laici, catholici, etc. but the churches are empty. And when you go on a Sunday, you don't see strollers for young kids outside the church. If I walk into a church on Sunday, I feel suddenly young. And I am 71. So, I come now to what we heard. What does it mean, if I may be so bold, to the community of the faithful to live in this kind of reality. <clears throat> and I want to organize what I have to say now in the following way. I want to, there are three traps that one can fall into as a result of living in this kind of secular culture, which I just described, where the community of the faithful have become a minority. And understanding those traps in some way can give pointers to what and how one might conduct oneself. So, the first trap is exactly not to fall into the trap. We are all children of the French Revolution. It's part of our self-understanding. That religion, to internalize that religion is a private affair. Of course it is also private. Of course, when you are alone in prayer, etc., it's private. But we cannot fall into the trap and think that it's only private. Another little funny story? May I? Am I exaggerating? He's just being polite. <laughs> I, 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 at New York, I have something called the Transatlantic Dialogue, where I invite European politicians to come to a conversation with me. I've had many, many interesting politicians from Europe, including Mr. Morawiecki. But also others, the president of Italy, Napolitano, Giscard d'Estaing, but also, I have remained nameless, a senior French politician. So the first question I ask him is, how do you understand yourself? And he says, I'm French, I'm socialist, and I'm Catholic. That's my self-understanding. And then for an hour and a half, we discuss. And then comes the last question, and I say to him, Mr. 
If somebody would come down from Mars and they listen to the last hour and a half, they would certainly know that you're French. They would certainly know that you are socialist. They would never guess that you are Catholic. In some ways, he's a good Catholic. It's not just I was born Catholic. He's a practicing Catholic. And he says to me, Mais Monsieur, of course not, because that's a very private thing. I make my point. So what does it mean not to fall into that trap? And I want to now combine that also with the Christophobia. So the prophet Micah says, it's my favorite citation from the entire Bible. He said, what does the Lord demand of you? To do justice, practice charity, and walk humbly with your God. Humbly, but he doesn't say walk secretly with your God. In a secular environment, it is sometimes embarrassing, threatening, uncomfortable. Not in a proud, arrogant, hubris way to present yourself as a religious person. Many of my Catholic friends, before they eat, they cross themselves as a reminder that the food we eat is a gift of God. But I've seen many of them, when they're not in the family or not among friends, they don't cross themselves. Why? They're embarrassed. It's a private thing. I do it when I'm together with us. It's a tiny little thing. But in my view, it's so significant. It's the internalization of the French religion is a private thing. You don't d demonstrate it in public. I give you another thing. You will all agree with me, I think, in this room, that Sunday, the day of the Lord, in some ways should be different from every day of the week. Now, each one can decide in what way it has to be different. Don't follow the Jewish way. It's very tough. <laughs> and I'm sure you all remember the teaching of Jesus. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Wonderful. But it should still be different. There should still be, according to how you've defined your way of respecting the day of the Lord, to say, I love doing this thing, but not on Sunday, for example. Because on Sunday, it has to be different, etc. That, like the crossing before meal, it's a tiny thing, but it's so significant that in a secular society, it's not only for yourself, although it's principally for yourself, that you say Sunday is a different day in my life, every week. But it's also a sign to society. Here is somebody who gets invited, I'm not going to say to a football match because that's another religion. <laughs> but he says, thank you so much for the invitation, but I don't do this on Sunday. Wow. I will return to this theme in a minute. But that's what I mean. We cannot internalize that heritage of the French Revolution that religion is a private thing. And when I go into public, I'm like a Marano. You know what the Maranos were. No? It's the Jews in Spain who had to pretend they were not Jewish, so they were, Marano means pigs. They had to pretend that they are Christian or that they are not Jewish, so at home they would close the, the, the curtains and light the Sabbath candles, but when they went out, nobody could guess that we cannot internalize that dimension. So that's the first thing. The second thing is more serious 
because it pertains to public policy. What I talked until now doesn't pertain to public policy because the demoralizing thing, nobody prevents people from, in the micro way, walking humbly, but not negating one identity. It's a self-choice. The second element is another of the mistakes of the heritage of the French Revolution. And it's the idea that secularism is neutral. It's not neutral. It's a choice. Where do we see this? We see it in France. We see it in the United States. And the most important place where we see it, but we see it in many other occasions, is in the field of education. So in the United States, in the name of neutrality, public schools have to be like secular. Because a public school are publicly funded. If you want to send your kids to a Catholic school, it has to be a private school. So the parents have to pay. The state will not pay because if the state pays for a Catholic school, it is breaching the principle of neutrality. We also saw this in the famous crucifix in the classroom. What the chamber of the European Court of Human Rights said, seven to zero, the state has an obligation of neutrality and therefore if the state requires, as it does in Italy, to display a crucifix on the wall, it is breaching the principle of neutrality because it's endorsing religion, in this case Christianity. So it has to be neutral, so there can't be a crucifix. I want to explode the myth that secularism is neutral. It's a legitimate choice. It's a legitimate choice for society. The French Constitution in Article 1 says the state is laic. If that's what the people of France want, it's their constitutional right to do it. But don't call it neutral. So how am I going to try and explode that myth? And it's an important lesson for us because it pertains to public policy. So let's take education. In the name of neutrality, the state cannot fund a religious school. If you want to send your children to a religious school, you have to have a private school for which the parents are responsible to fund it, etc. It cannot get money from the state. There's an alternative conception of education and it is practiced in the Netherlands and in the United Kingdom. Because in today's society, <clears throat> the cleavage is no longer between Protestants and Catholics or between Christians and Jews or Muslim, etc. The cleavage in society is between religious people and secular people. Now, I respect secular people. It's a worldview I do not share, but I do not condemn it. Religion is tough. So what is the British and the Dutch approach to neutrality of public education? They say, if we only fund secular schools, it means that secular parents can send their children to a school which is funded by the state, and religious people cannot send their kids to a school which is funded by the state. And then they say, that is not neutral. So how can the state really be neutral? So both in Holland and in the United Kingdom, they will fund secular schools. They will fund, of course, schools of the Church of England. But in the interest of non-discrimination on grounds of religion, they will fund Catholic schools, they will fund Jewish schools, they will fund Muslim schools. 
they will insist on certain things in their education. You also have to teach mathematics, you have to teach English, you have to teach Dutch, etc. But it's perfectly okay to teach the religion that the parents want their children to grow up with. And the Dutch and the British say that is real neutrality. Because then we are not taking sides in respect of the major cleavage of today's society between the religious and the neutral. You tell me, which is more neutral, the American way or the British way? It's obvious, isn't it? But so easily we fall into the trap. Let me give an example from the crucifix on the wall. And the example I will give you is exactly part of my pleading before the European Court on Human Rights. It was kind of funny, you already know me, because I think in the first time in the history of the court, I said I want to present to you a parable, a parable that I invented. And it's the parable of Marco and Leonardo. And I deliberately chose those names, Marco from the Gospel and Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Marco comes from a Catholic family, Leonardo comes from a laic family. And next week, they are going for the first time to school, grade one. So Leonardo visits the house of Marco, <clears throat> and he sees a crucifix on the wall. He says, what's that? And Marco looks at Leonardo and says, you don't have a crucifix in your house? How can you live in a house without a crucifix? That's terrible. So poor little Leonardo runs home and he tells his mother, why don't we have a crucifix? We have to have a crucifix. And his mother says to him, we respect Marco and his family, but we are different. We have our values, they are noble values, a little bit like the Polish constitutions, those who accept them with the religious origin and those who accept them from a laic origin. So Malko says, okay. Then the next day, Leonardo says, okay. The next day, Marco visits the house of Leonardo. He walks in and he says, hey, where's your crucifix? And Leonardo says, crucifix, that's old wives' tales. Who believes in that kind of nonsense? So poor little Marco runs home and says to his mother, why do we have a crucifix? Leonardo said that it's old wives' tales. It's all nonsense. And his mother says, we respect them, but in our house we will have a crucifix of the Savior. Now they go to school. Two hypotheses. They go into the school, and there is a crucifix on the wall. Leonardo runs to his mother and says, you see, also the school has a crucifix. Hypothesis two, they go to school, there's no crucifix on the wall. Marco runs to his mother and you see, you see, also the school doesn't have a crucifix. Neither position is neutral. It is a choice a binary choice which has no neutral option. So if in Italy you have a crucifix, you have to teach the children, we have a crucifix, but we respect Muslims, Jews, and atheists. It's okay. And if in France you don't have a crucifix, you're under an ob educational ob obligation to teach the children although we don't have a crucifix, but we respect our pupils who believe in Christ, etc., etc. But don't tell me that not having a crucifix is more neutral than having a crucifix. It's a binary choice where there is no middle. So that is the second thing. It is so prevalent in our society to imagine that secularism is a manifestation of Neutrality. Now, a second uvaga. When I talk about these things, these are the public manifestations of identity in our public spaces. At an individual level, 
our tradition in Europe is that we respect freedom of religion, but we also respect freedom from religion. And sometimes it's not easy to respect both at the same time. So for example, imagine an English school. In England, talk about neutrality, mother of democracies, there's an established church, the Church of England. The queen is not only, the king is not only the sovereign, <laughs> the king is also the titular head of the Church of England. So if is it okay in a public school to have a photograph of the king? I imagine it is. But it's like having a photo of the Pope because it's not only the head of state, it's also the head of the church. Is it okay to sing the national anthem in a British school? It's a hymn from the prayer book, God Save the King. It's a hymn from... So how do we reconcile freedom of religion, freedom from religion? Not by separation, by accommodation. So for example, you could say, if somebody on grounds of conscience does not want to sing God Save the King because any mention of God is against the conviction of his parents, of his family, etc., that should not be a reason to expel that kid from the school, etc., but the fact that some do not want to mention the name of God should not prevent the others from doing that. We have to find an accommodation, which is not always easy, but it's not mutually exclusive. It's not the kind of polarization, if you're not with me, you're against me. We live in this kind of society. So now I come to the most important part, and the most challenging part of my presentation. And where do I start? I'll start with arguably one of the most important political theory, theorists of the 20th century, which is John Rawls. And John Rawls, speaking about the conditions for a democratic society, so it's not about free elections, etc. It's deeper than that. And he says, democracy can only work when debates about public policy, which then get translated into law, which is dramatic in democracy because a majority binds the minority, can only be done on the basis of rational discourse, of reason. You come into the public space, in the piazza, in the parliament, etc. And it should be a debate which is based on reason. And therefore, his conclusion was that religious people, Christians, cannot be part of that democratic discourse because they have a commitment which is not based on reason. It's an article of faith. I am a Christian and therefore for me this is a non-negotiable truth. You, you don't negotiate it. You can say to somebody, you can talk to me from now to further notice. You will not shatter my faith. And therefore he says, they cannot really be, you cannot bring into the public space argument that comes from, for example, your Christian tradition. Now, it's a funny kind of argument, which actually liberal theory has difficulties with it. Because we say we believe in freedom of religion and also freedom from religion. But why can I come into the public space with my socialist, with my liberal, with my neoliberal convictions and worldview, and it's legitimate, 
but I can't come into the public space with my Christian worldview. Again, to sharpen the example, a new government is formed, let's say, in Italy. And somebody would say, they don't have enough women in the cabinet. You might agree or not agree, but nobody would say that's not a legitimate argument. To say we need more women in the government. But if somebody said there are not enough Catholics in the government, you can't say that. Catholics for the sacristy. That's an illegitimate. Why? On what basis? Not enough socialists, not enough women, not enough vegetarian. All that is legitimate. It's only not enough Christians. You can't say that. Liberal theory. We'll get to courts. Liberal theory has a difficulty in explaining that. The most decisive argument to explain that comes from John Paul. And you know, Ratzinger to John Paul is like Joshua to Moses. And in his famous and controversial, I don't know why controversial, but controversial speech in Regensburg, Ratisbona, Ratzinger, following John Paul, gives the explanation why there has to be freedom from religion. And the explanation is not liberal theory, because I explain liberal theory, socialism, yes, Christianity, not. Because they explain there is a religious reason why there has to be freedom from religion. Because any coerced religious practice is not pleasant in the eyes of God. In Abrahamic monotheism, it's not only the belief in one God. It's not only the belief in a transcendental God. It's not a stone, it's not a river, it's not a golden calf, etc. It's also covenantal, which means it's an offer, which if you accept, it's fine. But if you force to accept it, that is not pleasing in the eyes of God. Coerced religion is of no religious value. It's a religious explanation to the principle of freedom from religion. And that's why Ratzinger, ooh, you remember, because he said, he accused Islam of not understanding that principle, that you cannot coerce religious faith. You can, but then he goes on to give the most decisive reply to Rawls. He doesn't deny the Rawlsian premise that in our liberal democracies, public policy should be based on reason. He doesn't say, no, that's wrong. He says, you don't understand Christianity. Why? Because when the Christian comes into the public space and says, you should have this law, you should not have that law, they do not do it on the basis of revelation. They do it on the basis of natural law, which is, remember Cain? He doesn't say to God, you never told me you're not alone. They say, we Christians, when we come into the public space and argue for this policy or against this policy, we do not base it on revelation for the reason I just explained two minutes ago. Because we do not want to coerce people to accept religious proposition based on revelation and faith. If you do not accept it, autonomously, it's of no religious value. 
But when we argue from natural law, we are not basing it on revelation. It is true that the Ten Commandments say thou shalt not kill. But we're not saying in the public space there should be a law against murder because the Ten Commandments say it. We say there should be a law against murder because it is against natural law that everybody understands whether they are religious or atheist. I think we're all on the same page. But it's important to understand the John Paul and Ratzinger position on natural law as part of that discussion about what is the place of the religious persona, the religious community, in the making of public policy. When they step in, it has to be on the basis of natural law and not on the basis of revelation. Now comes the more difficult and challenging part of my lecture, and I'm sure I'm sticking my neck out, and there will be quite a few executioners. <laughs> Natural law is very tempting. Why is it very tempting? Because it's the passport of the community of the faithful to legitimately enter into the public space of public policy making. If I can say this is natural law, it's not about revelation, you don't have to be a Christian, you don't have to be a Jew, you don't have to be religion, I'm reasoning with you this is natural law and therefore I have a passport to be a legitimate part of this discussion. Rawls just didn't get it. And therefore it's very tempting. We like to take our convictions, and if we construe them as natural law, it's advantageous, because then we have the passport to argue for public policy, for the polity to adopt them into law or to reject certain laws, etc. So we see the temptation. What I want to do now is to show some of the risks we take some of the costs we pay when we are excessively zealous to turn our convictions into natural law. So this is not an argument against natural law. It's just trying to say the third uvaga, where should be the limits of our claim for natural law. And I'm not going to give a categorical answer. I'm just hoping to make you think it really is worth thinking about. Not everything we like, we should immediately translate into natural law. Point number one <clears throat> is if we make a mistake, if we claim natural law when it's not natural law, when really it can only be reasoned by revelation, we are doing exactly what John Paul and Ratzinger warned us against. We are forcing onto people a religious belief by the power of law and not by the power of reason. Because if it's based on revelation and is not legitimately natural law, it's not pleasing to the Almighty. So we have to be careful. From a religious perspective, we have to be careful because we don't want to do that. We as religious people do not want to coerce others into accepting norms, the legitimacy, the basis of which is revelation and transcendental truth. So that's the first warning. But there's also a danger of credibility. If we are too zealous in translating everything into natural law, we run the risk they will say, you're cheating. It's just a magisterium presented as natural law. We don't want to be in that position. We really want to be able to defend the natural law rationale without any reference to revelation. Now, it could be a lot of natural law is also revelation. The Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. But observe the Sabbath, that's revelation. 
it's a good public policy to have a day of rest, but not a sacred day. That's religion. But what I am interested is what happens within our communities. And that is particularly important where we are becoming more and more a minority. So we have to be very, very attentive to how we transmit the tradition to our children. So that's the perspective I'm now going to offer. So number one, when we present an argument as natural law, in a way we are detaching it from the word of God. If you ask your child, why is it not allowed to murder, it is most likely that your child, a teenager, some, I'm not talking about a five-year-old, would say, because it's immoral, it's unethical. It's less likely they, they will say, because it's against the Ten Commandments. I'm making this as an empirical observation. So in a way, we are removing the hand of God, the word of God, from these norms. So we should be careful about it. Number two. Again, thinking about how we educate our children. Every argument we present of natural law is now subject to the discipline of reason. Now, the discipline of reason is not absolute, correct? So, we are in a society, and the society debates some of these policies, and they decide, no, it's not against natural law. In a secular society, we suddenly, in a weaker position, vis-a-vis -vis our children to say, natural law, natural law, not natural law, it's the word of God. Suddenly you remember it's the word of God. All along, I was thinking about it as natural law. Now my friends, my school, the newspapers, they tell me, no, it's not natural law. We are undermining the authority and the immediacy of revelation. And remember, I told you before, it's my firm belief that even your faith, Christianity, is not exhausted by simply having an ethical life. There's sacrament. There's mystery. There's heteronymous norms. It is so because it's the will of God. I give you now a real example. Divorce. In this country, in the 1970s, there was a referendum which changed Italian law to introduce divorce. And a couple of years later, there was a new referendum to abolish the license for divorce. And the church campaigned vote to abolish the license for divorce. Which now, which pardon? The church. Which year? 72, 72, more or less. I say 72. I am 71, so my memory is a little bit... It was a mistake in my view. It wasn't simply a mistake. Am I talking too long? Too short? You give me 10 more minutes? Okay. It wasn't simply a mistake because they lost the referendum. What did they lose? <clears throat> the way I read the gospel, Divorce is clearly revelation. The law as it existed until then, the law of Moses, divorce was allowed. The rules in, the, in the, the five books of Moses about divorce. And Jesus comes and says, in three of the Gospels, no more divorce. And in one, no more divorce except in the case of adultery. And even that has now disappeared. So I see that as a clear example of revelation. Now, it might be that you believe that that's the most perfect way to be married, but it's not the only way. It's hard to argue that the prohibition on divorce is natural law. 
most people would say, if two husband and wife stop loving each other, if they hate each other, if they're fighting all the time, and they together agree we want to divorce, no, divorce. The Protestants do it, the Jews do it, the Muslims do it, atheists do it, etc. What do we lose when we say it's natural law? Now again, let's go back to educating our children. If our child asks, so why are we not allowed to divorce? We Catholic, why is marriage insoluble, indissoluble? The answer is not because that's natural law. The answer is because we are different. We are Catholic. And in our tradition, marriage is a sacrament. And it's a sacrament in which there are three parties. Husband, wife, and the Lord. And that sacrament is indissoluble. You're committed in this trilateral understanding of marriage until death do us part. If it's a natural law, you lose the ability to tell your children, we do it because we are different. Because being Catholic is not only being ethical, etc. It's also there is a transcendental truth which is our understanding of marriage. It's the word of Christ. And that's what we live by. And if others divorce, don't look down on them. We would like them to be Catholics. We think that's the way to salvation, to the truth. But if they're not, they're not immoral, they're not bad, they're just not Catholic. And being Catholic, you tell your children, is special. It's different. It's a different relationship to life. It's a different relationship to love. It's a different relationship to the Almighty. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's not easy. Who said it has to be easy? In a secular society, it's countercultural. Yes. Now, you see, the example I give by divorce shows you something important. It's a reminder that revealed law has a normative power which is not less for the religious persona than natural law. It comes from a different source. But the fact you say it's not natural law does not mean that it is not binding on you, that in some ways even more, because it's distinguishing. It's an interesting way of un reinterpreting the Kantian position. It's autonomous because I feel freely accept the covenant. But what I freely accept is to be bound by a heteronymous norm, which is not Kantian. That's how God wanted it. We should not lose that possibility, especially where we are not controlling the culture, to be able to tell our children, sometimes we have to be countercultural. And sometimes countercultural means exactly this new Kantian pact. Autonomously, we accept the covenant, which includes heteronymous transcendental truths. So all I'm trying to say is that the temptation, which is great, the more natural law, it's like a passport with many visas, because I can enter into public policy and say, this is how it should be, I'm not arguing. It also comes with certain dangers that I've explained. I think I've talked enough, thank you.
Professor Weiler, thank you very much for your. Okay, it's okay. Oh, here, yeah. Professor Weiler, thank you very much for your lecture. And now we have time for some questions. So if you allow, please, some questions to Professor. Not too difficult, please. Any question? Thank you. My name is Bruno Petrosic, and I come from Croatia. So uh, <clears throat> I like Croatia. I have a house Me in too. Tvar. Yeah. Uh, I'm part of a CREATE program here at Angelicum where Sister Helen and others created this program to be a dialogue between Eastern or Southeast Europe uh, with Western Europe because they detected that there is something wrong going on with Western Europe societies and there is something healthy in Eastern Europe society, let's call that so Poland, Hungary, Croatia and especially regarding the, the Christianity or Catholic Church within those countries. And I think, so this is like a proposal or a question, that the difference between those two uh, possible uh, Europes is that the, the one, the Western Europe, is built on individualism. And the East, Eastern Europe is built on communitarian nature of society. So we have big, like, national identities, uh, we are culturally bound to religion. Uh, at the end, we had communism for more than uh, 60 years oppressing us as a nation. So would you say that we can say that this is big difference between communitarian nature of society and individualistic one? And uh, I would also- Why don't also we stop here and I answer and then you ask your second question. Yeah. Okay. I want to say two things. First, I'm in total agreement. <clears throat> but I want to express my agreement in a slightly different way. It's not often that I speak to an audience like this. Usually I speak to an audience of very faithful people to so-called liberalism. And then I say to them, I want to tell you some of the costs of secularization. And I immediately add, I've not come to evangelize anybody. I'm not even Christian. And I also say, I do not judge people by their faith. Because I know religious people, truly religious people, who are very awful human beings. And I know confirmed atheists who are noble. I already said, when it comes to ethics and morality, we don't have a monopoly. But I say with secularization, we lost in our societies one important thing that was ubiquitous before rampant secularization. We all the time now talk about rights. Rights, rights, and rights. Think of somebody in Italy. Somebody in Italy, his or her rights are protected by the Italian Constitution and the Italian Constitutional Court. And if they don't have satisfaction, there's the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights of the European Union, and they can go to Luxembourg. And if they're still not happy, then there's the European Convention on Human Rights, and they can go to Strasbourg. Make no mistake, I would not like to live in a society that does not protect against fundamental human rights. Shall I say it again? I do not want to live in a society that does not protect the minority and individuals from the tyranny of the majority if they violate fundamental human rights. But, I want to give you an example from the treaties of the European Union. It says, nationals of the member states are citizens of the European Union and enjoy all the rights and duties specified herein. 
That's the first and last time that the word duty is mentioned. We live in a society which is enthralled by rights, and rights atomize, rights, are rights of the individual against the collectivity. And we do not have a discourse of duties. We do not have a discourse of individual responsibility, not just individual rights. How is that connected to secularization? Because before secularization, in our public space, whether you were religious or secular, every week in every church, in every city and village, there would be a discourse of duties and responsibility. I've never heard a priest talk about your rights. It's always about your duties, your duties to society, your duties to your neighbor, etc. No politician in Europe can speak today about duties. Your only duty is to pay your taxes and observe the law. When something bad happens in society, our reaction, why does the government allow that? Why aren't they doing something about that? It's never, why am I not doing something about it? Why is it not my responsibility? So, again, I'm not evangelizing. I'm just making an empirical proposition. Secularization has brought about the elimination of the discourse of individual duties and individual responsibility towards the collectivity, towards society, towards the state. There's no politician in Europe today, nowhere, who could make the speech of John F. Kennedy in 1960. Don't ask what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It cannot be said today. You would be called a fascist. <laughs> so in that respect, the religious sensibility is a sensibility of duties. It's not as if they negate rights, but it's not the principal discourse. It's love thy neighbor as thyself. If you read chapter 19 of Leviticus, it's a very modern chapter in trying to ensure social justice. Forget about the ritual part of it. It's in chapter 19 of Leviticus that you find, love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord. And then always comes a ritual, don't mix wool and linen. Forget about the ritual stuff. It's a very modern program of social justice in society with one huge difference to our current sensibility. It's all based on duties, not on rights, on individual duties towards the other. So in that respect, you see that I am in agreement with you. Yeah, you. Secularization has meant the elimination of a discourse of duties. And a discourse of duties is a discourse of duties towards your neighbor and towards the collectivity. It's not me as an individual and my rights, it's me as an individual and my duties towards others, towards society. My, my, I'm sorry, my suggestion is to put only one question, if it's possible, because we have many participants who would like to... S I'm sorry. And I'm sorry if I talk too much. I, I got that from my father. He even talked more than me. All right. uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Father Hendrianto. I'm a Jesuit priest from Gregorian University across the street. So I'm kind of misplaced here among the Dominicans here. S slowly, sir. Please, right. slowly. Thank I'm you. a little bit deaf. Okay, uh, I'm a Jesuit priest from Gregorian University just across the street here. Uh, my question is like this, that you mentioned earlier about some countries in Europe that have constitution that contains reference to Christianity or God. Uh, but if we look at the fact, the reality is I think that uh, those constitution in fact is not Christian constitution anymore. For example, if you look at Irish constitutions, while the preamble made reference to Trinity, but the fact is the law already legalized same-sex marriage and abortion. So my question is, 
do you think that based on natural law is still possible to have a Catholic Christian constitution without any reference to this I mean, word? Thank you. The answer is, it has to be. Because it's like the Ten Commandments. So God says, thou shall not kill. Thou shall not murder. Lotir tzach in Hebrew. Thou shall not murder. You should not kill the innocent. But when we go into the public space, we cannot go into the public space and say, we have to have a law against murder because it's in the Ten Commandments. Because that would be against the John Paul and Ratzinger. You cannot impose on people something that is rooted in religious belief. You have to be able to rationalize it by natural law. And thou shall not kill, and abortion is part of the universe of thou shall not kill. You can go into society and persuade democratically your fellow citizens that that should be the law. We know that it's controversial in our society. It's your duty as a Christian to fight for that with legitimacy because you're basing it on natural law. Whether it is possible or not depends on my second definition <laughs> of what it means to have a Christian Europe where there's a critical mass, not even a majority, of people who accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then they are very engaged with that message, but when they go into the public space, if they are against abortion, they will root it in natural law they will not root it in revelation. We should not root it in revelation because if we root it in revelation, we are imposing the word on God on people who are not accepting it voluntarily. Not everybody agrees with me, but I think to the best of my understanding that is faithful to the teaching of John Paul and Ratzinger. Okay, uh, I have a question. I am, I am, <laughs> I am Thomas. I am from Poland. I am a JP to studies. Where in Poland? Uh, from the central part. I'm from the uh, city where Saint Maximilian Kolbe was born, uh, from Zdniska Wola, in central Poland. And I have a question because, uh, like you, professor said we have to be a little against the culture in our faith. So, is it possible to be against the culture and at the same time avoid, like you once said, the ghetto mentality? No. <clears throat> the ghetto mentality, and, oh, you, in my book I wrote about the ghetto mentality, I said, Many Christians have built, put themselves in a ghetto which they built the walls. And people said, how dare you use the metaphor of ghetto, blah. Spokoine. You can, because the ghetto mentality means you keep it to yourself. Micah, do justice, charity and walk humbly with your God, but not secretly with your God. So not only can you be countercultural, you should be countercultural. It's what I think you call testimony. In the way you live, in the way you present yourself in society, it's people are looking and saying, they are different. They are Christian. They're not just professing ethics and morality. Of course, that is central. It's indispensable. It's a necessary condition. The category of good and bad is not a religious category. Cain and Abel. The category which differentiates the religious from the secular is sacred is sanctity. It has no meaning in a secular worldview. So you can be countercultural because you're saying, of course, I preach ethics and morality, 
but I'm also leading a life where I'm trying to be touch the sacred, touch holiness. That has no meaning in secular worldview. You are not in the ghetto if that's the life you live. You're only in the ghetto if you hide it. If you're a Sunday Christian and in the rest of the week you are Marano. Thank you. Okay. Can I uh, just ask? Um, you're, you're mentioning this uh, danger of uh, falling into imposing uh, religion, uh, revelation in the public sphere as opposed to uh, the natural law. It, it just occurred to me that uh, isn't it is, it, is it that much of a, of a, of a distinction or, or, or a dichotomy in, in, between natural law and, say, theology, for example? Uh, could, couldn't you argue in the public sphere with someone and saying, look, this is the premise, and you don't have to say where it's from. This is a premise. Do you accept this premise? And maybe it's natural law. Maybe it's just a conclusion from theology because uh, the theology of St. Thomas is very much based on Socr uh, Aristotle, excuse me, on the philosophy, natural philosophy of Aristotle, which is not uh, revelation. And, and I mean, so you, just, you bring up these premises, and the person says, yeah, I'm willing to entertain that premise. Yeah, that sounds right to me. And then from there, you, you reason and you come to the conclusion that he's willing to accept and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. And then if you go back and say, well, you know, this one was maybe leaning on, re not revelation as such, but leaning on maybe not pure uh, natural law, uh, I mean, wouldn't you, would that be imposing? Because uh, I mean, it seems like you're making too much of a, of a distinction there. I mean, for, this is my impression. And, and, and just a second thing, I mean, do these people that say, well, you can't bring in religion into the public sphere, are they maybe... Uh, carrying a false, exagger exaggerated notion of what we as Catholics do. We don't just uh, blindly accept things by faith. We, you know, we, we have premises, we have reasons, we, we, we we're convinced of what we believe. We don't just accept it blindly, which I think maybe is the pos position these people have when they say you can't bring re in religion because that's, you're just imposing something without any argument or any, anything that's convincing. I mean, if you address that. I think that if I understood your question correctly, maybe not, I apologize. I think you're touching on two distinct issues. So a religious person can say, when I take the norm, thou shalt not murder, the sixth commandment, <clears throat> for me, it's the word of God. And that's what drives me. All I'm saying, and it's not only me saying, it's my understanding or misunderstanding of the teaching of John Paul and Benedict, that when I take that religious commitment to the Ten Commandments and I go into the public sphere, I have to be able to explain it by reference to natural law and not to revelation on Mount Sinai. So it might, it's not that I have to negate it to myself. I just have to be disciplined that when I go into the public space, I have to be able to rationalize it with integrity as natural law, because otherwise I will be imposing religion on non-religious people. And all I warned was that the temptation to translate everything into natural law, even towards ourselves, creates a certain disconnection from, we forget that it's the Ten Commandments. Well, you should not murder, obvious. You forget that actually it's the living word of God. The second thing is, the second issue is the public space and the private space. So here, for example, in the United States, one of the judges of the Supreme Court, a good friend of mine, she said to me, I cannot talk to you anymore because you argued 
that it's legitimate to require a crucifix on the wall in a public school. Nota bene, fourth uvaga. The crucifix can be on the wall, but I should not require everybody to genuflect. Why? Because I think the European way is the following. At an individual level, we have to respect freedom of religion and freedom from religion. And I already gave you my thesis that freedom from religion is a religious proposition. It's not derived from liberal theory. In fact, liberal theory has difficulty in explaining freedom from religion. There's no freedom from socialism, but there's freedom from religion. But from a religious point of view, it's totally understandable. But in the public sphere, in our symbols, our identitarian symbology of who we are, I argue there's no reason to eliminate our religious heritage. <laughs> Look around us. What, are we going to tell all the countries which have a cross in the flag, you can no longer have a cross in the flag? It's part of the history. Are you going to tell the British that they have to change their national anthem because it says, God save the king? So it's not a violation of freedom from religion if the state in the public sphere says we respect our heritage and our history and part of our history is religious. We should not be in self-denial of who we are and what we are and how we came to be who we are. So it's one thing to say it's okay if you want to have a cross in your flag. It's even okay to have an established church, which we have in the United Kingdom, we have in Denmark, we have in Greece, etc. If, God forbid, a British soldier is killed somewhere, automatically there will be a religious funeral unless the family says, I'm not Church of England, I'm Catholic. I'm not Church of England, I'm Jewish. I'm not Church of England, I'm an atheist. And then they will have an atheist funeral, a Jewish funeral, a Catholic funeral. But automatically, there would be, that's in the public sphere. And I argue that our modern state requires us to respect at an individual level freedom of religion and freedom from religion. In the public sphere, it doesn't require us to negate our collective identity, even if an important part of that collective identity, as is the case in so many European countries, is tied up with a religious heritage. So there I don't see a contradiction. But not everybody agrees with me. Not everybody agrees with me. After Lao Tse, believe me, I had a lot of hate mail. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Jan Park. I am a graduate of John Paul II studies, and currently I'm studying at Jagiellon University, where three years ago I had an opportunity to... I'm having difficulty yes. on understanding uh, you, so okay. the microphone uh, close to your mouth and please okay. speak slowly. Okay. Uh, sir, my name is Jan Palka. I am a graduate of John Paul II uh, studies, and currently I'm studying at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, where three years ago I had opportunity to hear your uh, uh, lecture. Uh, with Francisco Clonchon de Berrier, and this is my question. It's very quick. He's being very polite. Yeah. He's not saying you gave exactly the same lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. It wasn't yeah. exactly yes. the same, but you know, my father used to say every rabbi has only two sermons. And then he thought a minute and he said, no, actually, only one sermon. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your previous uh, lecture also. And I'm not sure if you answered uh, like two minutes ago uh, this question that I will say, but uh, you mentioned that religious law shouldn't enter the public sphere by enforcing it, uh, enforcing, uh, enforcing, uh, enforcing it by government. And wasn't it the mosaic law from Old Testament that entered the public sphere? After all, it was um, a kind of co confessional state. Totally right. 
And today, because we're very polite, it's okay to be Christophobic, but it's not okay to be anti-Semitic, right? <laughs> it's okay to be Christophobic, it's not okay to be Islamophobic. But I want to explain to you one huge difference between Christianity post Second Vatican Council on the one hand and Judaism and Islam on the other hand. Judaism and Islam have not had a Second Vatican Council. So just as you say, they have no compunction to impose religious law on atheists, on non-believers. It is wrong, in my view, from a religious point of view. Although I'm a practicing Jew, a sinner, but still a practicing Jew. For example, in the state of Israel, fasten your seatbelts. There is no civil marriage, which means if people want to get married, they have to go before a rabbi, before a priest, or before an imam, even if they are confirmed atheist. I have a niece who said, I'm not willing to go through this hypocritical charade. I'm an atheist, and I organized for her to get married in Italy in a civil marriage, because it will be recognized in Israel. But in Israel, you cannot have a civil marriage. That is exactly what you're saying. It is imposing a religious what significance has a religious marriage, a sacrament, for somebody who's not religious? It's a travesty. And Islam, as Ratzinger pointed out in Regensburg, is even more extreme in that respect. But really, this is one, as I say, it's not polite, it's not politically correct. Who? Oh. How can you say something bad about Judaism? How can you say something bad about Islam? But it's the truth. Those two religions do not, have not reached the proposition that you should not impose on non-religious people religious norms. And I've given you one example. So yes, you are right. Now, please, uh, last question of Michał Paluch. Yes, Professor Weiler, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. It was a pleasure to follow it. And I think that I'm... Now it's going to come, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 before, I want to say that I'm very close to what, to, to, well, to, to, to your understanding of the current situation. I understand this, your understanding as a piece of advice of an, our elderly brother who used to live for a long time as a minority. And probably it's the time to, um, how to say, for us, for, for the Christians but in Europe, to, to, you know, to, to learn something from this experience. Can I make another funny experience. statement? But, but I love I'm, the elderly brother. <laughs> But we, we all, first you, of all, I'm 71. You, you said it, but, you said it. <laughs> but we all know that God always preferred the younger brother. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Anyway, I won't comment on that. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I want to ask is, uh, I would say that, that what you presented to us and what, for example, for me is very, very close to what, what I understand and what I would like to leave, um, is an answer for the modern world, so to say. And I think that the recipe given by John Paul II and, and Josef Ratzinger, it was a very good, brilliant recipe for the modern world. But now we are coming to the next edition of this world, which is called quite, quite often postmodern world. And for example, in this new edition of, of our world, it seems to be more and more commonly accepted that such concepts uh, like natural law are in fact, in the end, 
religious concepts. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with it, and probably you don't, but I would like to ask you whether, whether you have some clues, some tips, how to, how to deal with uh, this kind of, um, of understanding, you know, of, of our intellectual situation and, and, and how to enter in this kind of uh, intellectual discussion today. Thank you. I'm glad it's the last question. It's a hard question. Can I take time to think about it? No. <laughs> uh, I want to say something. It is true that in the postmodern world, it's relativistic. In a way, it challenges the notion of truth. All truth is subjective. You have your truth, I have my truth. But only up to a point. Because the debates about natural law are always debates of the content of natural law, of the limits of natural law. But even the most postmodernist, you know, a Derrida, a Foucault, if you ask them, if the majority said it's okay to murder, would you say that's okay, it's just that's their truth? They would say no, it's not okay. And then you would say, on what basis do you say that it's not okay? Because none of them would say it's okay, it's their truth, so we just live by their truth. And then you would ask them, so on what basis do you say that even if the majority says it's okay to murder, national socialism in Germany, it's not okay. You should fight against it. And they would give you a very convoluted answer, but basically it comes down to natural law. It's a Kantian answer. It's some form of the categorical imperative. It's some form of you can't do, do to others what you would not want to do to yourself. So the debates about natural law, I think, if you really uncover them, are not as relativistic as some people say. It's usually the debate is what should be included and what should not be included in uh, natural law. You know, the Supreme Court decision recently in Dobbs about abortion is an interesting decision. Because what they said is the American Constitution has nothing to say about abortion. It's totally up to the democratic decision of the states in the United States. Nothing to say about abortion. Nothing. But that's what they said. The American Constitution has nothing to say about abortion. So they eliminated the right to abortion. <laughs> but they said Mississippi can go one way, New York can go another way. That's okay with the American Constitution. That's relativism. So before, you know, what a wonderful decision, etc. Think. It's a complicated decision. It's a challenging decision. But I think there are big debates on the limits of natural law. I don't think that even the most postmodernist would say national socialism have their truth and I have my truth and we have to respect both. They would say no. What they're saying is not true, is unacceptable. You can't kill people because of their religion. That's not relativism. They will coat it with complicated words, but deep down, there's still a common core of natural law that we all accept. The only question is, what are the limits? How far does it extend? Professor Weiler, once again, thank you very much for lecture, for this seatful discuss. And all of you, I would like to invite to the next lecture from GP2 lecture series by Professor Vittorio Posenti, which will take place on November 16. Thank you very much. Thank you.